Hello listeners and welcome to the Motel Weekly Podcast, bringing energy matters in an informal setting. The war in Ukraine shows no sign of abating, and nor does the risk of supply stops of Russian gas. Moscow has already cut off supplies to Poland and Bulgaria, largely as a response to their unwillingness to pay in rubles rather than in euros. As part of a sixth package of sanctions against Russia, the European Commission is now looking at ways to ban crude oil imports from the country within six months. But what about gas? Could Europe cope with a sudden halt to gas flows from Russia? And what would the impact be on prices and energy consumers, both large and small? Helping me, Richard Sverson, to discuss the key issues facing Europe's gas market is Trevor Sikorsky of Energy Aspects. Welcome back, Trevor. A warm welcome. Thank you, Richard. Always good to be here. You know, it seems as though Russia's cut off Poland and Bulgaria. Well, it has. And who's next? There's lots of discussion at the moment about who's, you know, who was responsible for the, you know, these these kinds of reductions. Was it um, just a, a, you know, a, an unwillingness to pay uh, by the Polish and the Bulgarians that led this led to this uh, happening, or was it actually them paying in in euros and and then being told that they hadn't paid uh, and kind of had that money sent back to them, and therefore then that led to the suspension of the the contracts and I, I you know there's at the moment there's just a lot of hearsay uh, but what we do know is, is as you've said you know the, the Polish contract and the Bulgarian contract both of those contracts are uh, for reasonably small volumes um, but also expiring at the end of this year so they're not uh, very long lived ones uh, you know have been suspended and and then we have a whole bunch of payment deadlines coming up in May. And it is going to be a big question to see, are some of the really big contracts, you know, with German buyers, with French buyers, with Italian buyers, are those going to suffer the same fate or is there is there a workaround? And I think that's the kind of key thing the market's kind of grappling with at the moment is, uh, you know, just what is the legality here? Just what can you do and can you not do uh, in terms of being in line with sanctions? Now, certainly there's, you know, certain, I would say, legal re- readings of this that would say that you can open up a you know a ruble account you can open up a bank account with a uh, Gazprom bank and neither of those would be really against the sanctions you could pay in euros and if you could ensure that the transaction into rubles was done fast enough um uh, you know it would also uh, be consistent uh with the the current you know with the current sanctions you wouldn't be breaching those and if you look at the commission guidance the commission yeah, I mean that—that's what it is. It's guidance. It's not a legal interpretation of, of, or you know, a binding legal interpretation of what would be against the law and, and what would be breaking sanctions. But that does point to the possibility of basically providing a loan, and and the way you would probably interpret that in terms of you know providing a loan to the Russian, you know, to a Russian party, which again would be breaching sanctions, would be if that transaction takes too long to go from being uh euros to being rubles and so there's just a lot of grayness um that you know everyone's trying to cut through in, in trying to understand i would say the market pricing generally isn't factoring in a massive amount of disruption but you certainly can't rule out some additional ones and so you know a number of european uh, smaller european buyers have come out and said we you know we're likely you know not even going to try to do this in some ways you know, and we we are probably going to, or we're not going to pay in rubles, uh, and therefore you could see those sanctions. You're looking at Orsted doing that, maybe Gas Terra doing that. There's a few other of the smaller ones uh, doing that. I mean, there seems to be, you know, I mean, it's very complex. It seems to be food for lawyers here more than anything, you know, because on the one hand, the the European Commission is saying that kind of system breaches the sanctions. So, what kind of advice would you give to these? countries or, or smaller companies than uh, true well i mean it's you know it, i'm not a lawyer thankfully because um, that is difficult but i mean it i think what you'll see is a lot of the you know the companies that are affected by this will get you know some very very good legal advice on on how they can you know kind of satisfy both both kind of parties here you know both the russian state of course and the european uh you know uh commission and 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 you know, all of the Western sanctions uh, and being in line with those and not breaching any of those. And they will probably reach out to their governments as well to, and say, this is what I'm going to do. And, you know, and is this OK? And and probably, you know, cover themselves two ways, one with legal advice and probably two with, you know, at least an unofficial 
approval for, for how they're going to proceed in this matter. Like I said, it doesn't feel like the market is pri you know is pricing in yet a huge amount of disruption. Yes, there's maybe a little bit of risk in there, but it doesn't feel like uh, the type of price response you would get if a lot of these contracts start disappearing and all of a sudden a lot of Russian, even more Russian gas starts disappearing out of the European balances, you know, you would see a much higher price coming. I've seen some commentators say that Poland and Bulgaria were chosen because they had soft targets. I mean, what's your view here? Could Moscow pick another soft target uh, in, in the middle of May? You know, there's just a lot of rumor in here say about exactly who was responsible. Did they try to pay? Did they not try to pay? You know, did they just say, well, we're going to continue to pay as we've always paid, you know, and then have it sent back, which is possibly what happened, you know, in the, and, and, and like you said, they're not that big. And B, they were, you know, they were, they were contracts expiring anyways, right? So they didn't have a particularly long shelf life. Now, a lot of the other contracts do have quite a long shelf life. You know, if you look at the contractual waterfall, there's a big chunk of things, you know, disappearing this year. There's about 24 BCM that's set to expire at the end of this year. Now, and you could say all of those contracts, maybe, you know, because you're only looking at maybe losing six, you know, six to eight months of, of of supply under those that's a reasonable amount of value anyways but you you know you could probably get that hit but if you're looking at a 10 or 50 you know something that still has 10 or 50 years to run you know a big chunk of those contracts still have that legacy period to go um that would be a much bigger you know economic hit to to take um by by, by the russians and probably they they would be more active in trying to to get those on side you know to to get those on side so I think there's, there's still a lot of questions on those little ones, but yes, you know, they happen. They weren't, you know, they probably were an easier loss uh, for, you know, Gazprom to take. So maybe it was, you know, sending a signal that they were serious about this. But certainly, you know, it, it would be a little bit of a shock to the market to see some of the bigger guys, um, you know, have have this have the same outcome as, as what we saw with Poland. Mm. How big a risk is a, a total cut in supplies? I mean, you know, and the other thing is, what is Moscow thinking? What is Putin thinking? I mean, could he realistically cut everything? I mean, is, is, is that in line with the st strategies you've seen so far? I mean, very hard to, to double guess what, what Mr. Putin's thinking. Um, <laughs> you know, rationality in some ways, you know, left the building quite a long time ago. You know, and we are into you know, some, some very difficult real politics. Now, I think, you know, if we look at how serious and how difficult would this be if you had a total withdrawal of supply, it would be massively, massively difficult. You're still seeing, you know, 120 uh, BCM or something, you know, every, on an annualized basis coming in, but that's a lot of gas, you know, on a monthly basis, you're looking at 10 to 12 BCM. And it would be very hard to, you know, it would be hard to meet demand. It would be hard to, to fill storage, right? So you'd have a lot of problems with winter as well. So it would just be enormously difficult and you would have to see enormous amounts of demand being shed, you know, between now and, you know, and well, until <laughs> you could replace or or lose that demand. And, and that would probably fall heaviest on European industry. So you'd probably and you probably would see things like, you know, the suspension of markets. You would be into, you know, governments needing to dictate, you know, what what losers, you know, or, or what users get lost you know, and will lose their supply. So it will be very difficult. It would be very painful um, for Europe as a whole, you know, and this would be a real, I think, a real weaponization of gas, you know, and it would be seen as, as you know, a, a further deterioration in, in the relationship between the West and, and Russia, of course. It's a, at an all-time low anyways, but it would be, you know, it, it would be even uh, deeper and more complicated. Yeah. So in terms of the energy crisis, I mean, if that were to happen, you, we haven't seen anything uh, yet, really, uh, that could uh, can compare um, to such a situation. So um, and the price impact, of course, would be phenomenal, wouldn't it? Uh, so. Oh, yeah. I mean, you would see, you know, prices that probably doubling from where they are, uh, you know, in, in the, you know, the, in the current levels of around, uh, you know, 100 euros, you, you know, you could easily see a doubling of of prices because you would just need to, to get a whole bunch of European industries, you know, switching off. And that, that would either be done through the price mechanism or, like I said, it would be done by, you know, at some point you would expect states to intervene and start physically kind of rationing 
gas to various sectors and, and, and dictating that, you know, gas would go in various places and that would be very damaging for the European economy. Russian gas is still flowing, right? I mean, we've had, you know, it's been quite volatile in terms of the actual volumes, but you know, it's still coming through into Germany, into Slovakia, isn't it? So um, what's your, have you done any an analysis on the, on the flows versus nominations here, for example? I mean, when we look at this, it does feel like, you know, nominations are generally be, being met by flows. Um, you know, you are seeing potentially slightly higher nominations coming from some of the European buyers, given that Poland now is not nominating on those contracts. So you are, you are having to see a bit more, you know, gas coming in there so that it can be reversed through Molno. We have seen reverse, reversal flows through Molno quite a bit this year. So it's something, you know, we're, we're kind of used to seeing and used to living with, but those are probably a little bit stronger than but generally you know it's certainly you know Gazprom hasn't been for quite a long time selling any incrementals over contract volumes generally we we don't see nominations from their uh, subsidiaries that's Gazprom marketing and trading wind gas the likes of those um or or at least no, nomination levels that aren't are consistent with contract levels that would exclude those those kind of contracts in them it has been we've already lost year on year you know, a big chunk of Russian gas and we're probably, you know, with all of the contract expiries, if they're expiring now or they're expiring at the end of the year, you know, this will take another, uh, we've got about 24 BCM of contracts expiring this year. A couple of those have already gone, which we've talked about, but none of those we, we would see being extended. And so you are looking at, you know, next year probably have, you know, there being less Russian gas again, with less Russian gas again, you would say this is a market that looks structurally tight. And if we lost more than that 24 BCM, of course, it would be structurally tighter. What about getting that Russian gas, which is, you know, reducing, the volumes are reducing. What about the supply constraints getting that into sort of Eastern and, and Central Europe? Um, because th these countries are very reliant on this gas. They have very little of it, or they don't have a diversified uh, supplier base to choose from. So how, what kind of constraints are there there, Trevor? Um, well, I mean, I think what you're seeing is a real change in the kind of structure of trade flows within European gas markets, right? And so historically, you know, we have set up um, a world where gas would come into the into the east and 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 move west and yes you had some gas you know coming in from the north certainly you know um and a bit of you know and the lng would periodically come in into the west and now here we're in a place where there's just a wash of lng coming into the you know in into the, the more western markets and you're seeing big constraints on the uk so the uk taking as much lng as it can you know reason you know and ex and then fully exporting to the continent same constraints in spain and what that's leading to of course is a very big basis differential. So you're looking at the TTF compared to the MBP, the MBP at a massive discount and similar with the, you know, with uh, the, the Spanish pricing point. So you're looking at these kind of more energy islands is just taking a massive, massive discount because they are where a lot of the spare capacity on LNG is. And there is a big, big pull from the TTF and hubs to the east of those to try and get enough gas in to move that around Europe. And that's proving to be very, very difficult, and we just don't have probably enough interconnection between those markets where the gas needs to go to replace all of the lost uh, Russian inflows that we're having. And it, it generally, maybe more globally, are you seeing any changing supply route trends? Um, yeah, I mean, I think what we're seeing is if we're looking at big, big changes in, in how the markets are functioning is you used to kind of see a lot of flexibility in, in the European market. And so it was providing the global flexibility and therefore the TTF was kind of the floor price. And then the JKM would just need to outbid up to a point where it had enough gas and then the residual would come in from the European market. Now that's changing because a lot of the flexibility we have in the European market is disappearing with, with all of that Russian gas going out. And as a result, the Europeans are now in a position where they have to structurally outcompete the Asians for LNG. Right. And that's probably going to continue for a number of years now. So you are this place where you are looking at gas prices saying there's not enough global gas around. Having lost all of that Russian gas in the European market, there's no way to get it into the Asian markets. So it's a net loss into global gas supply 
the outcome of that, of course, is prices are just trying to find some degree of demand destruction. And that demand destruction can either come from Europe and its industry, or it can come from South Asia and its gas demand, or, you know, Northeast Asia and its gas demand. And we are seeing that that kind of pain being shared, you know, across, uh, you know, certainly across the non North American gas markets in a way, because we are just as a as a global gas market, we are just losing supply. But on the demand side, we've been quite, you know, Europe has been aided by the lockdowns in, in, in China. You know, that, you know, seeing some a loss of demand once the Chinese economy starts to move out of, you know, if, if you know, Shanghai, Beijing come out of lockdown or Beijing isn't, but Shanghai is. How do you expect those kind of demand dynamics to change and, and supply demand dynamics even, Trevor? Yeah, no, I think it's a very good point. And probably one of the big analytical questions at the moment is we have seen now for, you know, four or five months in a row, Chinese LNG demand being lower year on year. And, you know, historically, it's it's been something that was, you could bank on being growing year on year. And 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 I think there is a question, you know, how much is that lockdown? And, and it certainly contributes. And how much is that price responsiveness of Chinese buyers to very, very high, you know, high global gas prices? And it would be great to say we've, you know, we've completely got a, a complete answer on that. <laughs> but, but certainly, um, uh, certainly it's a mix of two of them, you know, and we've certain so there, there are some price sensitive um, parts of the, the, the Chinese gas demand balance is certainly the trucked LNG sector, i.e. that sector that's off grid. Um, tends to have an ability to switch to oil products and has been doing that over the last couple of months. So there has been, you know, that demand sensitivity there. And you know, some of that demand sensitivity we were seeing even before the lockdown started in Q4, kind of. And you did have a, a mild December and January, and that, again, it contributed to quite weak Asian demand for LNG. So all of these things have kind of helped. And at some point, they, they, they will kind of change, particularly for Northeast Asia, and you would say, you know, as we go through the summer, the Japanese and the Koreans will want to restock, the Chinese will want to restock, and of course you've got talks of infrastructure-based um, stimulus in the Chinese economy coming, and if that really, you know, starts to boost energy demand again, you would expect gas demand to start going up there, and then it really becomes a, a bit of a bidding war for LNG, and so, you know, there is a lot of upside to potential pricing if that comes, right? And it's hard to be massively bearish by just saying, well, as long as Russian gas flows, we can fill storage. Probably we can, but we still will want to bid uh, away a lot of LNG to help make up for the Russian gas that we are losing. Europe has also ambitious plans for restocking ahead of the winter, you know, up to 90% uh, storage, you know, up to 90% full. Is this realistic? Uh, is Trevor? Well, I think, I mean, there's a number of things. One, possibly 90%, it depends on, you know, how much LNG <laughs> continues to come into the market is going to be important to to meet that. Of course, uh, the commission's targets were a little bit lower, but you have 90% uh, at, at, in a few member states. So probably the weighted average is, is slightly lower this year, but still, uh, you know, the those minimum storage targets, to the extent that, you know, that, that people have to fill them, takes just takes more flexibility away from the European market, right? It makes it harder to do that. It means prices are going to have to work harder in the European market to get all of that gas into storage. Storage was, used to be one of your balancing flexibilities. You could get, do anything from 80% in, in a very, uh, around 80% in a very tight year. And of course, when it was loose, you would see it going up to, to close to 100% full, right? So it was something providing the market with a lot of flexibility and as soon as you start saying particularly you know for 2023 when actually it will be you know from what we see a 90 percent minimum storage carryout that minimum storage carryout all of a sudden becomes very difficult to meet it it's no longer flexible it becomes quite a rigid part of your balances and 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 you know the market will have to look for flexibility elsewhere and that flexibility is either getting enough lng in or of course, it's about demand destruction. A few weeks ago, Trevor, we we talked about replacing Russian gas, and you were very skeptical about how that could be done. Certainly, this year, maybe not even next year. Is, is, has anything happened over the past few weeks that's made you change your mind at all? I mean, I 
there's there's, there's certainly limits and in, into how much LNG can do that, right? And and I think we're probably at, at those limits now, and we're seeing a lot of tension amongst those countries, or we're seeing a lot of discounts in those countries that have the spare rear gas capacity, which is of course in Spain. Um, so I mean, I think you know certainly the weakness in in Asian demand. And there's been a number of reasons for helping that weakness in Asian demand has maybe surprised a little bit to the upside uh, in terms of that. But I think we are kind of at those almost at those limits, right? To, you know, and uh, as we just talked about, there are some things, you know, on the horizon where you'd say, well, if these things shift, then some of that LNG probably isn't going to come, you know, be coming into the markets. And, and maybe that's more, Q, you know, towards the end of Q3 and the beginning of Q4, that they start to really play out and become problematic, you know, and start to take some gas away. But it does feel like further losses than what we've already got, you know, become really problematic to replace. And that, I think, is the thing to watch out for. And that's why there's a lot of push to get more FSRU capacity in quickly because that would come into those markets that are most affected by that. And, you know, it wouldn't be so congested and constrained and that would help out. But again, you know, you would say, well, Europe is at this place where structurally it's just going to have to pay above the Asians, you know. And if you get some of the more, you know, the Asian buyers that have that ability to pay, which is Japan and Korea, and probably China, you know, competing uh, for 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 scarce cargoes, then you're in a in a place where it's just going to be bullish cycle upwards, and 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 that is you know that that certainly is something that wouldn't surprise us very much if if we see that. So I mean, in terms of uh, prices, it's all looking very constrained, and which means really prices can only really uh, move upwards in an upwards direction. So would that be a fair summary? The risks are biased to the definitely biased to the upside, right? Yeah, those are where the risks are. I mean, this month will be quite important because it's all you know. We we do, we started talking about which other contracts could go, and if a lot of contracts start going around now rather than at the end of the year, of course, that's taking more gas out of the market and is something that has to be replaced. And with the best will in the world, you're probably not seeing new FSOU capacity coming in. <laughs> until very very late in this year or, or early next year you know you're looking at maybe some of the ships coming in for september some of the the fsrus that have been chartered but you still have to connect them that usually takes a couple of months in terms of building out you know the infrastructure to do that so it's going to be a difficult year and there's a lot still a lot of upside risk i would say into where prices could go the downside is maybe if we don't see very many, you know, we don't see a, a huge amount of additional disruptions coming from those Russian contracts, and and maybe the market takes a breathes a sigh of relief, and you know, and maybe those prices go slightly down. But there isn't a lot of downside, I would say, to come. I mean, of course, we're talking reasonably big swings in prices that you can see in this market. In the old days, if you said, well, there's ten euros downside, that would be enormous. But ten euros downside doesn't feel that enormous anymore. In, the, in this context, so for those listeners who aren't familiar with FSOUs, those are fl floating storage units. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so really, Trevor, just a final question: the coming weeks are going to be crucial. Then we've heard noises coming from Russia that sort of mid-May is is when they will decide which contracts maybe will go or, or which countries they could cut off. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's you know it it's quite political now. I mean, there seems to be a legal way through that people can make payments if they want and the you know in in the big question is you know do you want right and if you're just saying well i'm just going to pay in euros and then there is going to be no transfer at any time from my side into to rubles then that's problematic and that could lead to further suspensions of contracts and and of course every time we get a suspension of contracts you know it will you know remove a bit of volume out of out of the balances and that will provide some answers. Trevor, thank you very much for, for being our guest on the Monta Weekly Podcast this week. Thank you, Richard. So listeners, you can now follow the podcast on our own Twitter account, aptly named the Monta Weekly Podcast. Please direct message any suggestions, questions, or you know, let us know if you, if you think you have a good idea for a guest on the show. You can also send us an email to podcast at montelnews.com. Lastly, remember to keep up to date with all that's happening in energy markets on Montel News. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts and Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. Thank you and goodbye.